Welcome to Issues. As you know, Issues is a show for the community, and we try to find the movers and shakers in the community and have them on Issues. This evening, we're very, very excited to have two intelligent, handsome, brilliant doctors with us. We have Dr. Elton Trott and Dr. Yusuf Wade, OBGYN, women doctors. Now, it makes me wonder, and you will wonder too, when you see these gentlemen, how handsome they are. I'm wondering if the, if the ladies are coming to them for medical services or to look at their handsomeness, but we'll find out. Welcome, doctors. Right. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Trott, OBGYN, what are those initials for? Well, OB stands for obstetrics and GYN stands for gynecology. Um, basically, the obstetrics is comes under the heading if you, once she gets pregnant she'll come under the heading of obstetrics and that's where we take care of the baby and the mother until the baby is born. Gynecology is when she's basically not pregnant and any other issues that she may have that are unrelated to pregnancy but are female related. Okay. Now in terms of uh, be, becoming an OBGYN, Dr. Wade, what are the exact schooling that you have to go through? Yes, it's, I can laugh because it, it seems like a lot now, but as you're going through it, it's, 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 it's just a part of the process. Um, on average, it's about 12 years. That uh, seems like a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, usually, of course, high school, then you go to college, do some individuals do four-year degrees, and then you move on from high school and you go to medical school, which is another four years. By the way, these gentlemen were very keen in telling me that they graduated from Bark. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. 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 Rest <laughs> case for now. Yes. Um, <laughs> And so after medical school, um, in medical school, you choose what specialty you want to go into. And um, with obstetrics, it's a four-year residency program. And so when you do the general total, it's about 12 years. Wow. Now, did you gentlemen uh, go to the States? Did you go to England or Canada? Where, where did you go to medical school? Oh, um, my, well, my first undergrad experience was in Canada. And then I moved to the United States, um, Nashville, Tennessee, at Meharry Medical College and then on to uh, Drexel University uh, to do my residency um, in obstetrics and gynecology. Yeah, and for me, I did my, uh, as my pre-med in Philadelphia, I did medical school in Philadelphia, and I did my residency in obstetrics in New York. Okay, yeah. now let me ask, is there a difference, to your, uh, in your opinion, is there a difference between the medical training in Canada as compared to the United States? And I do know that there's some medical schools in the West Indies. So is there any difference? Or basically, if you go to medical school, you're all learning the same thing? I guess in my opinion, I think you're all learning the same thing. The human body is no different if you're in the Caribbean, if you're in England, or if you're in Canada, it's, you're learning the human body, so it's all the same. Um, I guess the only difference that may come into place is the, the training with regards to once you're finished your residency, with regards to getting certified and stuff like that, it's a little different once you've completed your training. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it is a little different in that respect, but the overall experience and what you learn, I guess it's going to be essentially the same. I, I, I can second that. Mm -hmm. um, the curriculum is pretty much set. You know, mm -hmm. there's certain core courses that you have to, um, you know, master uh, before you can graduate outside of uh, medical school. Um, the, as Dr. Trout was saying, Alton, um, you know, what happens is, is based on what jurisdiction you're training, whether it be the United Kingdom, uh, North America, uh, they have certain uh, board requirements yeah. that you would have to do for that jurisdiction. And I think that's pretty much where the, the difference lies. Now, why did you choose to come back to Bermuda, Dr. Wade? Well, one of the things is, you know, I was born uh, and I grew up here, I should say. Uh, I was born in the U.S., but I, I grew up in Bermuda. And, um, you know, this is where I would like my family to grow up. And I have a young two-year-old son. And so coming home with all my family here felt to me uh, a natural thing to do. Not only that, you know, you learn certain skills uh, overseas and you want to bring it back to the community. And, and we as a team have started to do that to show some, some new of some of the modern, uh, what we call minimal evasive surgery. So uh, I think uh, bringing that to Bermuda is, is, is joyful for us mm -hmm. as, as a team. 
Yeah, and, and along the same lines, uh, you know, born in Bermuda, raised in Bermuda, just went to the U.S. for education, more or less, and to come back home and to bring our experience and knowledge back here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just like Dr. Bate was saying, you know, we've trained in and learned certain things with regards to surgical procedures that we wanted to bring back to the island, which were not present in the island while we were away, and to do those procedures here so women do not have to go to the U.S. or Canada to get the procedures done. Mm -hmm. um, so we were the first to do a total laparoscopic hysterectomy um, here on the island, which was the first. So, you know, that's the type of things that we want to do and to bring back to the island. Yeah. I forgot to mention that both Dr. Wade and Dr. Trott, they have their own practice. Now, just tell us uh, their particular name and where's your practice located? The uh, name of the practice is Contemporary OBGYN, um, located in the Arch is 13 Berry Hill Road. Um, it's a, we, we try to create a setting, more of a family setting. You know, a lot of times, uh, when I know for me personally, when I go into the doctor's office, sometimes it's more of a sterile environment, but we try to create a family uh, type of environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do consider our patients family. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Now, Let's get into some questions dealing with OBGYN. How frequently should a woman see her uh, OB? Gynae? What is there? Kind of <laughs> what is it? <laughs> uh, it's OBGYN, uh, gynecologist, okay. obstetrician. We ha we go by so many names, yeah. right. uh, or just doc. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so how frequently should should they come in to see you? Well, I guess it all depends. If it's if you come if they're coming in for obstetrics, there's a set protocol which yeah. within every four weeks, every two weeks, every one week, depending on how many weeks they are pregnant. Mm -hmm. And for the gynae part, it also varies depending on what they're coming in for, uh, what they're being evaluated for. If it's just like for physical. Uh, well, there are different protocols in the sense that, you know, once they reach a certain age, certain things need to be done. Um, for example, pep smears and that type of thing, their physical exams. Um, there is a protocol that, you know, the U.S., the obstetrics and gynecology, basically they set a protocol with regards to when women should have their pep smears done, what age should it should be done. What, what age? Well, do you, well do that has changed. Uh, yeah. yeah, so... Uh, Based on the guidelines, at least at the age of 21, you should start doing your pap smears. Um, one of the things, though, to add to what Dr. Trott is saying is that, you know, at least once a year, a uh, female should see a gynecologist. Um, and, and, and that's just for an overall physical exam. It's important. It's just as with regards to men, at least once a year, we should see a physician. Right. Um, you know, the, the one thing about guidelines, just to piggyback on what Dr. Trud's saying, that each jurisdiction has certain guidelines, and based on one's experience and based on where one is changed, we try to go with those guidelines. And, um, you know, going back to pap smears, uh, the frequency of pap smears uh, has varied depending on whether a woman has had normal pap smears. So if a woman has had a series of normal pap smears, she doesn't have to do pap smears every year. Mm -hmm. um, however, if she does have an abnormal pap smears, the frequency then has to increase, mm -hmm. okay? Exactly. Um, and, and that's the determining factor. Uh, Failing that, every woman should have a physical exam once a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. I, I, let me ask this question now. A physician pointed this out to me. Um, I asked that same question, not really related to women, just in general. Mm -hmm. How often should someone have a physical? One of the answers that was given to me uh, if there isn't a presenting problem, if you're like in your 20s and 30s, and there isn't a presenting concern, there isn't a family history of some type of disease, then maybe not necessarily every year. How would you respond to that? Just in general, not necessarily women, women and men, how often should you have your, your physical? Well, I guess for us it's going to be kind of difficult for us to say for men because, because our, yeah. our training <laughs> since the beginning yeah. of our yeah. training has always been women. Yeah. So our our mindset is always yeah. set to women yeah. and when they need their physicals and from that standpoint. Okay. So just say for example, again, we go back to pap smears because that's kind yeah. of an important thing. 
is that you know it's once a year once but if you're if their history is such that it needs to be more frequent than that let's say they have an abnormal pap smear mm -hmm. for some reason then that frequency could be every six months mm -hmm. so it you know, it, it, it kind of depends on what the history is and what the underlying issue that we're dealing with to try to figure out what's going on. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. let's, let's move on to a different area now. When a woman becomes pregnant, how soon can that embryo or that baby be seen when they, when they come into your office and you take these pictures? How, how, how soon can you actually see a little baby in, in the womb. Well, that's kind of more so dependent also on the ultrasound machine that you're oh, using oh, oh, oh. to try to visualize and, the... And the technician. And the technician oh. as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that kind of dictates when you can actually see what's going on inside there. Sometimes if it's too early, the only thing they're going to see is basically just like a little balloon, if you will, with nothing in it, or a little sack, if you will, in there with nothing in it and you kind of have to follow up later and later to eventually see something growing inside there. So it could be two weeks, it could be, you know, whatever. It is, you know, the earlier you do it, the chances of you seeing something actually in there is less the sooner that you do it. But yeah, it could be a two weeks or three. One of the reasons why I asked that question, I'm going to be uh, a grandfather for the third time and mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. son and daughter-in-law sent us these picture of this little baby, you can see the baby with the oh, finger right. in the mouth and, yeah. and, and so forth. Now, what factors determine whether it's the woman is going to have a natural childbirth or, um, um, or an operation? Mm, C-section. C-section, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, there are many factors. Um, one of the things is, is that um, uh, presentation, fetal presentation, that's the baby's presentation. Mm -hmm. You have a breach presentation where breach meaning breach meaning where the foot is coming first. coming first and normally it's usually the head coming first. Yes, right. that's okay. correct. Um, you know, not to say that you can't do breach deliveries, but uh, oftentimes we're concerned about that because we, it's not safe as safe. Uh, mm -hmm. based on one's experience and based on one's training. Is it not safe to the baby or not safe for the mother, or both? Or both. Mm -hmm. I would say both. Mm -hmm. I would say both. The concern is, at times, um, is head entrapment. Mm -hmm. So feet comes first. Uh, when you look at the uh, anatomy of a baby, is that the head is usually, the per diameter, the largest part. So once the head passes, oh, the yes, body should yes, be able to yes. pass. Now, if the reverse occurs, sometimes you're unsure whether that head is going to come out and, and not be entrapped, okay? The other issue, too, is the, the baby's shoulders. The shoulders, you can get shoulder entrapment as well, but those are the things that you would be faced with if the head is coming first, and you can try and do maneuvers to, to deal with that. Um, that's one area, presentation for C-section. Other times, it's just based on whether uh, a mother has a very large baby and mm -hmm. her pelvis may not be adequate to uh, push out that baby. Um, you know, uh, with very large babies, that's another concern where you can do get shoulder entrapments and things like that. Um, you know, there, there are so many things we can also go on to talk about with regards to how a woman is progressing during the labor process. Um, we we all try to you know pursue a normal labor but some women and, and not for various reasons that we all can truly say we know um, their labor becomes what we call arrest of dilatation meaning that their cervix doesn't get to a point of 10 centimeters we're going to stop right then we'll come right back <laughs> wanted to stop right at an interesting part so don't go away we will be right back <laughs> Welcome back, and we have with us Dr. Yusuf Wade and Dr. Alton Trott, uh, OBGYN. Uh, we left off with the question, 
What are some factors that determine whether a woman should deliver vaginally or by C-section? Uh, Dr. Uh, Wade gave us kind of the first part to that answer. Now we're going to go to Dr. Trott for the second point. All right. Well, um, just to follow up on what Dr. Wade said, yes, you can have a vaginal delivery after a cesarean section. Um, we usually allow maybe two C-sections and you can still try to have a trial of labor to go vaginally. Um, what would we, I guess, preclude a patient from yes. having to have a vaginal delivery? Um, I guess one of the things was why, what was the reason for the C-section in the first place? Um, sometimes what happens is during the trial of labor, um, the baby, as Dr. Beard had spoken to earlier, doesn't come down. It arrests of descent it, or the cervix doesn't open up enough and the baby stops right there, which kind of may give you the impression that maybe the woman's pelvis is not adequate enough for a baby to come through. In which case, if you end up doing a C-section for that reason, it may not be in her best interest to try for a vaginal delivery the next time because we've already proved that maybe her pelvis is not adequate enough to have a vaginal delivery, mm -hmm. in which case you may just want to proceed to a C-section and do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, well, yes, she can have a, a vaginal delivery after a C-section, but there, as we spoke, to, spoke about earlier, is that when you as we're retrained in the U.S., certain things have to be in place in order for you to do a trial of labor for a C-section. Now, uh, vaginally, you, you know, uh, you see in TV, the woman or the doctor will say, well, how many centimeters? Well, normally, how many centimeters should the vagina be before delivery? Well, we are not really speaking about the vagina. We're talking about the cervix. The cervix is, if you want to think of it, as the gateway from the uterus into the vagina. Mm -hmm. And that is what basically holds the baby in place during the first 40 weeks or nine months. Um, and that's what has to open up in order to allow the baby to come through. And that has to open up at 10 centimeters because the baby's head, most of the time, is around 10 centimeters. Mm -hmm. Um, so once they get to that point and the cervix is actually pulled up over the baby's head, then yeah, the, you can proceed to a vaginal delivery. Okay. Now, eclampsia, I've, I've heard that term, and in fact, with uh, our first child, um, they admitted my wife uh, into King Edwards early because of eclampsia. Now, what exactly is that? Well, eclampsia, well, what she might have heard was pre- Pre-eclampsia. <laughs> pre-eclampsia. Pre exactly. Yes. Okay. Pre-eclampsia, uh, she uh, was yes, calling. Yes, yes, yes. It's right. two different things, right. and <laughs> eclampsia right. is a much... <laughs> yes, pre-eclampsia. Right. All right, yes, yes, yes. so pre-eclampsia. Well, basically that is sometimes due to a, a few issues with regards to what we're looking at, blood pressure issues. Mm -hmm. um, there could be liver issues associated with it, uh, kidney issues, mm -hmm. there, so there is a... Uh, a lot of the organ systems within the female body during preeclampsia that tend to kind of shut down, if you want to think of it like that. Um, so, now, it, it, it's, uh, these symptoms are, are they caused by the pregnancy or some pre-existing disease or something with the mother? Um, well, one of the things, um, mm -hmm. just to be quite blunt. There are many theories out there about preeclampsia, mm -hmm. and uh, we, and even in training and as I was studying, trying to get one actual true definition of a cause of preeclampsia, it's very hard uh, to pin pinpoint a, uh, a specialist uh, about that. One of the theories is, is that due to the increase in the hormone during pregnancy, it, it causes a vasospasming of the vessels and, 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 and it causes a shift, uh, spillage of protein in the urine, um, you know, uh, increase in blood pressure, and, 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 and sometimes you have what we call um, central nervous system symptomology, blurry vision, seeing spots and things mm -hmm. like that. Headaches. And well. headaches as well. Uh, and so, you know, the treatment for preeclampsia is delivering of the baby. Oh, right. No. So, um, so know, the baby is the cause? Well, I should say you can look at it that way. Yeah. The pregnancy, mm -hmm. which of course involves the baby, yeah. is the cause. Oh, and right. so once you deliver the baby, because the treatment is delivering, delivering the, the baby. baby. Oh, okay. right. So, and if preeclampsia is severe enough, mm. it doesn't matter how far 
you are in a pregnancy, the treatment is delivery of the baby. Mm -hmm. Right. Even if the baby is preterm, you have to deliver the baby. Wow. Yeah. Because you don't want it to go to eclampsia. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. They now, start having the seizures. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Th that's you. when they start having seizures. Okay. The mother. Mother but, starts having seizures. Right. right. Okay. And yeah, that's the point. You don't want it to get to. Okay. Right. Let's look at um, infertility. I don't know if you doctors, uh, if the doctors here in, in Bermuda deal with a mother who uh, is infertile. Do you? Do yeah. Yes, we do. We deal okay. with that in our practice as well. Mm -hmm. um, we get a, a lot of the referrals from the general practitioners mm -hmm. um, to us for infertility. What would be some of the, the, the reasons? Oh, it, it can be a host of reasons mm -hmm. for why she is not able to get pregnant. Um, we usually deal with the male issue first because that's the easiest one to deal with mm -hmm. or to evaluate if you want to think of it like that. Um, he basically gives a sample, we send it to the lab, and that gets evaluated. Does he go to his GP or would he come to He comes to us. Okay. He comes to mm -hmm. us. Um, and then we send him to the lab and we get him evaluated and we see the results of that. Because mm -hmm. basically we're looking, there's quite a few things we're going to look at, but we have to look at the number that he has as mm -hmm. well as are they swimming well and everything kind of along those lines. Mm -hmm. If, that, if everything comes back okay with him, then we can kind of move on to the lady because the, basically the workup gets more complicated, more invasive to determining what the reason could be. It could be related to her uterus, it could be related to her ovaries, it could be related to her tubes, her thyroid. It, and our hormones. And the hormones as yeah. well, you know, as well as the brain and everything yeah. else. So it becomes a very... Now you said the, the brain. Elaborate on that a little bit. Well, right? they can have pituitary issues oh, yeah. that can uh, affect getting pregnant as well. And as well as thyroid can affect it. There's something called polycystic ovary disease that can affect them not getting pregnant. So there's a host of things that we have to look at and evaluate. And once we figure out what that is, then we can try to see what we can do for them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't even figure out. There yeah. isn't anything that we can find. Yeah. Um, there are, you know, once, once, we, once we figure it out and we say, hey, everything looks normal, we can start doing, you know, some other invasive stuff like intrauterine insemination. Mm -hmm. Um, is that done here in Bermuda? Yes, we yes. do that in the yes, office yes, as well. Yes, um, you know, we do those a couple of times to see if they work. If they don't, you know, we kind of work with the patient. Well, we've tried everything that we can do here in Bermuda. Are you willing to go basically for IVF at that point? Yeah. Intro? In vitro. In vitro, in vitro fertilization. fertilization. Okay. Yes, yes, correct. In, yes. In, in, in your practice, are there some diseases or illnesses that um, a female may come in with that you have to refer to another doctor? Yes, um, you know, the, the diseases that um, we feel is more dealing with a lot of cancers, mm -hmm. you know, ovarian cancers, uterine cancers, and things like that. Um, and the reason why we refer uh, them to an overseas uh, center is because they have everything at that location. And I don't necessarily mean necessarily overseas, but to uh, another practice, not gynecology practice, oh. but another area of, of medicine. Uh, like you, you mentioned um, cancer, would you refer them to uh, a cancer specialist here in, in Bermuda? Well, the cancers, because we're gynecologists, yeah. the cancers that we see um, are the more common ones would be the uterine, the oh, ovarian, right. Right. cervical, and so that. Do you tr do you treat those or n no, no? We don't, okay. and no. and so what I was trying to explain was that in order for a patient to get the best care and the most optimal care for uh, for her treatment and therapy. Um, you have to send them away um, because they would have to get surgery and in some cases debulking surgery, radiation and chemo and, and you know some of the chemo and things you can do in Bermuda but the, the overall major surgery where they have to examine uh, the lymph nodes and things like that to check for any metastasis it's best to be done at a bigger center and doctors who are trained to do that mm -hmm. and they're called gyne oncologist mm -hmm. uh, and so um, you know, yes, we've seen it, but we don't have that experience in, in doing those surgeries and things like that that would, you know, help the outcome. Okay. Uh, but I guess let me just say something. Um, 
with regards to just going back to the infertility yes. and looking at say if it's a pituitary or thyroid issue right. now we're working them up for the infertility but let's just say that we find that it's a thyroid issue or yeah. a pituitary issue mm -hmm. um, then we would send them to one of the other specialists so if it's pituitary we'll send them to an endocrinologist mm -hmm. or you know, if it's a thyroid and it needs surgery or anything like that we send them to the general surgeon yes. or the internal medicine doctor to you know mm -hmm. to take mm -hmm. it beyond that now um, come to the end back to cesarean now um, it, it's my understanding that some ladies who have a c-section they're very concerned about after the c-section that when they have on their bathing suit you don't see <laughs> any marks now is there a, a special way that you guys do surgery to uh, preserve those women's looks well, yes, uh, I guess that, <laughs> that's one of the things that we try to give our Did patients. Did they ever discuss these things? They, with they discuss oh, it, and, yes. Yes, <laughs> and yes, that's one of the things that's that we try to That's the most important <laughs> thing. <laughs> the exactly. surgery can go anyway, but if that scar doesn't yeah. look how they right. want it to look. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 We, we do our best to make it as small as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and we tend not to use staples in the incision. We like to put a suture that's underneath the skin, mm -hmm. in which case, once they take the dressing off, it basically looks like nothing, nothing was with done. That. Nothing mm -hmm. was done. And they seem to be a lot happier with that type of closure instead of the staples, in which they have to come back to the office and get staples, staples removed, removed yeah. and they have the little marks on them, yeah. like a train track, mm -hmm. and they aren't happy with that. So we tend to. We spend a lot of time in the OR after everything is done trying to make our incisions look good. Very good. Yes, yes. Yeah. We have been talking with uh, Dr. Wade and Dr. Trot, and I, I think if I was in the childbearing years, I would sure encourage my wife to come <laughs> to you guys. Um, your phone number, so if anyone wants to, to reach you, how would they do that? Yes, um, well, you can reach us. Uh, we do have a website, mm -hmm. uh, Contemporary OBGYN. Um, you just Google that like we Google everything. Mm -hmm. um, our uh, contact number is 232-0894. And the other number is? 232-4828. Yes. Thank you so much. Again, we've been talking with Dr. Wade and Dr. Trott, OBGYN, and we've had a real good experience. We've really discussed some ins and outs. By the way, they were also here to talk about twins, which we never got to. So <laughs> sometime in the future, we'll ask these two doctors to come back. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next time. Thanks Thank you. for having us. Thank you.